are now at we are now going to start the session titled debate critical thinking and research methods in ancient pedagogy and the first talk is by dr sarita sheshagiri she is going to speak about reclaiming research rigor uh, rigor with tantra yukti so how many people know what is tantra yukti please raise your hands 1 2 3 4 5 good because generally uh, if it wasn't this informed an audience most people don't know what tantra yukti is so uh, to tell you about sarita uh, sarita holds a phd in political science from the national university of singapore a masters in political science from jawaharlal nehru university and bachelors in history from lady shriram college new delhi after her doctorate she joined some of the leading multinationals in mobile technology as a user experience researcher ethnographer in their research divisions she has presented papers in leading conferences on human computer inter interaction uh, user centered design and social technology in the course of her work she has led many studies that included field explorations in villages as well as semi urban and urban centers she has even participated in many funded projects that required foreign and multiple level domestic collaboration she has a rich ground level experience in managing diverse primary data as well as qualitative analysis of field data dr sheshgiri finds herself rediscovering bharata with every field exploration and every user interview she has undertaken over the years there are myths and stereotypes that constantly get debunked with each interaction and experience and the journey continues she says over to you sarita ji so just to time myself the time is 227 now yeah so um namaste namaste everyone um <clears throat> so i be, the the research the, the the objective of today's talk is how we can make qualitative present qualitative uh, research more meaningful uh, for present times in the modern uh, research pedagogical paradigm so that that is the base and the context um now to quickly go through this yeah so why uh, the thing is when i immersed myself in qualitative research uh, because by virtue of my background uh, political science it was not too difficult to make the dive into ethnographic research and uh, to begin with it was very it was it was fun it was nice because i'm getting to feel the pulse of the people but then at some point of time i felt that not all was right with what was happening and that is when some sort of self questioning happened luckily i came across some literature on nursing and nursing uh, looked at uh, certain uh, methods of recovery uh, and uh, co uh, convalescence or uh, practiced in ayurveda and by that virtue tantra yukti so it's like touching your nose this way but it was a wonderful uh, discovery and i'm like an infant still uh, opening my eyes and trying to make sense of what i'm reading so i'm very new um in this uh, indic uh, qualitative indic research paradigm right <clears throat> so my uh, talk today will be uh, along these three lines will be divided into why qualitative research why does it why is it useful followed by what are the principles governing tantra yukti a little different from you know you might think that the first and the second uh, subdivisions are a little away from each other but then i'm going to merge the two again uh, where i talk about problems in qualitative research and how tantra yukti, certain you uh, tools from tantra yukti can help this is just a a, a suggestive uh, kind of thing and i'm going to uh, i'm hoping that it'll open the floor for more uh, constructive discussion in academia for similar to this all right so as you can see that is me in the kadle kai parishe in uh, bengaluru on uh, bull temple road and this is part of one of the studies that i participated in i just felt that uh, you know this would uh, what i'm going to offer you today is not hopefully peanuts so <laughs> so there we are it's a festival it's it's a peanut festival the kadle kai parishe that uh, is happens every year okay so why is qualitative research good 
Remember, it has its moorings in sociology and social anthropology, which needed to be as close to the people as possible. It was not enough to just look at secondary literature and secondary data, which was also important. But what also was important was to get it from the people, to be there with the people. So as far as I'm going to talk about it maybe in the course of a question Q&A, but this has its moorings in Western uh, anthropological uh, evangelist traditions, and we can talk about it later. Okay, so uh, it was close to the people, and the, it, it, it was the, the purpose of social anthropology is to get a data that is thick with information and description from the people. So that's where it helps because you are there as an uh, objective observer. You're supposed to maintain objectivity, dispassion, all that comes later. Empathy, uh, surprisingly, was introduced later on uh, as, uh, as a perspective. It was not, uh, I mean, it had to be taught. It was not imbibed in the research methodology itself, in the research culture itself. Anyway, so um, the, typically what is required is for one to be a silent observer. You do shadowing. Uh, you do this uh, fun thing called fly in the wall. You don't get stuck to the wall specifically. But you, you stay away and you do some shadow observation quietly. You know, you're not in the face. Especially in rural areas, you're required to build trust. And you can do it this way. So that's one, and it allows you to go back to the, uh, res uh, the research site itself and maintain a con 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 continuous, uh, continuous, sustained sort of interaction with the people and build trust. And of course, there are lots of, in the user-centered UCD uh, perspective that I worked on, user-centered design, uh, uh, this allows a lot of participant-driven activities where we were trying to build solutions for mobile apps, uh, the home screen, uh, and, and, and various things. And so we would give uh, little tools to the people and have something like a workshop with the people. So in that way, it was participant-driven. And it allows you for that sort of activity. OK, something happened. Oh, that's new. Suddenly, I was like, what happened? So the principles of uh, Tantra Yukti. Now I'm going to bring in the second perspective of uh, the second part of my talk. Why Tantra Yukti? The thing is, all this was not new to us, to our ancient scholars. Uh, right from, uh, we have uh, Charaka, Sushruta, we have Panini, uh, we have um, Kautilya. We also have it in the way uh, uh, our acharyas interpreted and made sense of the ontological claims uh, that were put in the Vedas and the Brahma Sutras. They used certain uh, uh, methodological devices. They used a certain pattern, right? So that uh, tradition has always been there with us. Now let's understand, I'm sure uh, like a lot of you have uh, raised their hands so you know what Tantra Yukti already is. Um, so Tanoti, it comes from the root Tanoti, which means to enable growth. And uh, it is associated, uh, uh, Artha could be uh, wealth, but it's not just wealth, it's wealth of knowledge in the uh, context that we are looking at. And then Yukti is that which uh, resolves mutual contradictions and connects ideas and concepts so in that way. Uh, and of course, the idea, whole purpose was not just to build a thesis and construct a thesis, but also share it with an audience. So it allowed for a cogent intellectual output. That's where uh, Tantra Yukti, uh, those are the certain principles. And so our acharyas, um, uh, although Tantra Yukti, there's no specific book for Tantra Yukti, but we see flavors of that. Uh, even before uh, Arthashastra, uh, Charaka Samhita, Sushruta Samhita, and so forth, we see precursors of that in the Nyaya Shastras also, and also in the Dvaita Advaita dialectics. You see a lot of that coming in there as well. So the idea was to look at previous work, previous literature. Now we call it Richard, uh, literature research, right? So the idea was to look at previous work so that you know what are the contradictions going on there and where is the literature gap the knowledge gap. So the idea was to understand what, what is the, uh, like the, the third point I feel is very important, to understand where the phenomenon, the, where the cause will lead to a certain phenomenon and where it will not. So in that sense, a scholar was supposed to have understood all the various conditions under which the phenomenon would take place and then could say with conviction that this is where it will work, this is where it will not show up or it will not, this outcome will not happen. 
And uh, the last point I'm going to look at, uh, I, I want to bring to the floor, is that hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is, not a, uh, uh, is nothing else but interpretation. Right? It deals with how, uh, what the, in the present day, uh, for example, in qualitative research, the kind of uh, ethnographic research that I do, how, uh, what the uh, audience, what the participant is saying, how do you make sense of it as a researcher? How do you interpret it? Because there is always the interpretive part of it, so it becomes part of the interpretive science. Nothing but interpretation. This interpretation is nothing new. It was the basis, the background the, uh, uh, of our uh, ancient uh, uh, research methods. So the whole uh, process of understanding, comprehending, realizing through logical approach, and it should be correct. It's not just a question of logical inference. That inference should also be correct, right? So the, the, uh, you have the uh, pramanas that uh, you come up with. They should be ones that are sen uh, uh, correct and logical. So we have that as well. That is the background which we already had in Tantra Yukti. Um, so what are the problems in qualitative research? As you can see from what I started with, there are plenty. Uh, so these I call, call them practices or malpractices. It's not just, uh, 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 you know, um, um, what do you call it, an art or sub certain skill that's passed on, but it's also a whole set of theoretical constructs, constructs that get carried on from your guru, but not in this context of a guru. It is a person, a Western anthropologist, who typically has passed it on to his or her students. And that way, it just, over the years, uh, it just went on, uh, became a whole series of sci uh, what they call it social science, which obviously many of us are not happy with. And that's how it came on. So the prejudices got carried on. Um, I want to bring your attention to the fact that there's a lot of retrofitting that happens. You have certain theoretical constructs and paradigms, so you want to fit it to that. Whatever data you gather, you do some sort of a reverse engineering and try to put the uh, cart before the horse. So that's what is happening. I'm going to talk about uh, more and more as, uh, you know, I'm going to pro progress with that. I'm going to not spend too much time on this. So this is the crux of my talk, the next two slides, this and the next one. Um, so th the whole thing starts with when the research team wants to pick up a site where they want to conduct the research. All this is typically picked up based on what they have previously worked on, who they have previously worked on. Where is it more likely that they'll get data that will uh, fit their theoretical constructs? So they pick up, in, my, in the project that I worked on, uh, they typically went to certain areas of Bengaluru, of Karnataka, where they would only talk to certain uh, communities. Uh, say, for ex example, the economically challenged of certain uh, uh, of, of a certain kind to pick up the data from there and understand in this case it was about uh, digital uh, identities and how they handle their digital identities. So that's where they were working on and the, I, the, the, what, what happens with that is the whole internal validity um, of the study comes into question if you do that. Because what happens is you are not addressing the problem of, in this case, the digital identity of other economic uh, category, uh, sorry, the other communities are also economically challenged. I feel if we had applied, we can, Appa Varga, uh, which is called the rule of exception, and there is Vikalpa, which is the rule of uh, multiple uh, uh, options. So in Appa Varga, what happens is you can look at, uh, the, it's the responsibility of the scholar to say where this uh, 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 these uh, outcomes which you have observed of, say, the digital identity leading to such and such a problem or in the management of digital identity will not work because you have to look at the other uh, communities also, which they didn't. And the second is it will also help them understand what are the multiple ways in which this problem of handling digital identities beat various things of handling. Sorry, what happened? Oh, something happened. Bhaiya ji, Bhai sahab, uh, please help kar dijiye. Um, that doesn't matter, we'll just look at that. So where uh, it will, so what are the multiple ways the problem manifests itself? If you look at different communities, we could have done that. So um, that is the first thing, yeah. 
Now, what happened is there was this whole thing because they were looking at cherry pick data. Certain respondents answered in a certain way, oh, I have a problem with uh, privacy. I don't want to share my data. Privacy is a huge problem in India. Uh, people don't want to share with certain other communities. So that became a huge deal, uh, but only in certain responses, not in all. But they cherry picked that to make it seem that uh, that was a huge big deal because they were already working on these theoretical constructs in their thesis. And they already submitted uh, research proposals in foreign universities. Uh, dealing, with, dealing with that, so they were trying to bring that forth. I feel if they had looked at Samshaya, if they had brought in Samshaya, because uh, the other thing is Samshaya uh, helps you, uh, it's like detoxification, where you understand a, a problem that is thrown to you in different ways, and then you start detoxifying it like a medicine. So in this case, where they cherry-picked uh, data on privacy, they could have also looked at, uh, okay, what is privacy? How does it manifest itself among other communities? They would have started answering those questions in that way. One by one, look at different aspects of privacy, if at all you're looking at privacy. Um, so it's like, uh, what happens is what, you, what gets left out uh, often uh, is more uh, important than what was included. So if you brought Samshaya, you would have not just looked at it as just, just another research uh, uh, question or, or, or a doubt. You would have looked at it as different facets of understanding the phenomenon itself. Right? Oh, okay. Then there was the other thing of convenience uh, sample. I don't know if you're aware of that. Convenience sample is where I can easily, uh, uh, there's a certain location where I can get a certain kind of community to answer. I, if I go to the railway station or probably I go to the mall, then I know if I go to the mall, I'll pick up the youth. If I go to the railway station, probably get someone from uh, the middle class, low middle class, probably that sort of data set. So what happened is they already had that in their head. And the idea of picking up the convenience sample, guess why? To highlight majority minority clashes. So they would go to the uh, wholesale markets where you know certain communities of a certain kind would be selling their produce. And then they would start asking questions of a certain way, value-laden questions. Have you had problems with, uh, with the majority community? Where, uh, so there's no problem, no, nothing happened, nothing happened. 150 interviews would say nothing happened. Then they try to bring in deviance, deviation. What if there had been a problem? How would you have responded to it, right? So they're causing a deviation. It's not a natural deviation, but they're making it happen. Now, such value-laden questions I'm going to show you later, later on. But if these were answered, so there's already a Hetu that is pre-constructed. Now, if they had brought in uh, Tantra Yukti, what, uh, the certain tools of Tantra Yukti, actually even before Tantra Yukti, what happens is they, uh, they try to, uh, our ancient scholars, it's not just about Pratyaksha, what is manifest and what you observe. It's also about how you relate it to the Agama and what sort of logical inference you make of it through uh, Anumana. Analysis, loosely put it, right? So, um, yeah. I'm going to talk about deviant data again, because what happened is they were trying to create, like I said, the deviant data. The idea being, I don't want to just show homogeneity, or I just want to show divergence. In Samuchaya, what happens, it allows you to look at, even if there are different concepts, it allows you to see what is the commonality between them. And then you present, you refine, you distill that commonality and bring it to the audience so that the audience knows that your scholarship has been diligent. You're not artificially creating it. So you're reconciling. In fact, this is where even the first uh, 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 yukti that I mentioned about Appa Varga and Vikalpa can be brought back again. You're trying to understand where is the, uh, diver uh, uh, you know, the divergence happening, uh, the similarity and dissimilarity happening, and you're trying to reconcile it. All right? So um, next, no, it's the same thing. The la, uh, next one, sorry. OK. So I'm going to talk about uh, two things here. The last, these are basically the last two important ones. Um, so there was, uh, as you can imagine, so Anumata is what? Anumata is uh, where you pick up, uh, you look at previous literature and you see uh, why, where it is uh, agreeing, you know, what are the postulations that are similar to yours, right? So in our, uh, in this research studies that I, were, that I participated in, there was no dearth of Anumata. They picked up lots of stuff. Oh, the minority, majority clashes. Oh, uh, you know, there is a problem with privacy. The people from uh, this certain other community are taking away their privacy. Lots of stuff. So there was, everything was about confrontation, confrontation, divis divisive, literature on divisiveness. Lots of stuff they found. So there was no dearth of uh, Anumata. But Anumata alone cannot function. It has to be in uh, co collaboration, corroboration with Apadesha, where you critically look at what has been proposed previously, scrutinize it, then offer it. In this case, I'm also reminded of Purvapaksha. 
and Uttara Paksha. Okay, so that was not done. Uttara Paksha was offered happily. The, uh, India is a polarized uh, society, and this went on to the funders. That's what they wanted anyway. This went uh, to our academics, who were based out of certain foreign universities, which is what they wanted anyway. So it just reconfirmed what they already wanted. But if they had done proper Purva Paksha, they would have known where where all they are going wrong, and they would have refined their final statement. So that's what I'm not look, giving you examples. You can ask me in Q&A. All right. So the other problem is uh, case study. While it has all the merit of understanding uh, what sort of individual outcomes are made by specific members of a certain community, be it the SHGs. In this case, I'm using community to mean uh, a professional community, like the self-help groups, like the farming groups, like the tradesmen, whatever, so on and so forth. So it makes sense to look at it uh, in depth. But what happens is you can't pick that out and extrapolate it pan India. In the case of the study that I did, they were looking at, uh, in, an, in, uh, in another study, the women uh, entrepreneurs, the micro entrepreneurs, the vegetable sellers, vendors, and how they were having uh, certain problems with certain big shop, uh, shopkeepers, and how they were trying to cope with the challenges and what sort of uh, agencies they were gaining. But these were all individual level outcomes in specific parts of India. You can't put it out as, uh, uh, you know, the, the problem lies in the fact that social sciences, social studies, is trying to uh, posit itself uh, with positivism. Right? Uh, positivism requires you to make it, uh, make it uh, come up with predictive models. So you come up with a predictive model when you say, ah, this is how it is across India. This is how it is in uh, these specific uh, uh, sectors of India. Done. The problem lies is when you have not looked at enough uh, uh, data. But, but you can sort of, so Ekanta cannot work in that case. Ekanta will help you only if you look at more user sets, more data sets, then you can refine what you're uh, going to propose for whole of India, for the rest of India. But Ekanta alone can't work. Ekanta is universal rule, by the way. Uhya, it can work in conjunction with Uhya, where you look at context-conscious interpretation. But absolute interpret uh, interpretation is not possible of a phenomenon. So you leave it to the, uh, to the uh, what do you call, the viveka of your audience. And you lead them to that, not that you have left it like this, now you make sense of it. You can't do that either. So Uhya is, in this case, they could have said, these are certain emerging trends. These are certain ways by which they are creating, uh, these are the dynamics of the marketplaces happening in India. Maybe it can also happen in uh, Mumbai uh, uh, urban centers. Maybe it can happen in Tamil, uh, in uh, uh, Chennai urban centers. Possible. They could have done that if they had looked at the actual essence of these tantra yuktis, all right? But the idea was positivism. The idea was to get more funds uh, through their... Uh... So um, to quickly go through, so what, in conclusion, we haven't even started. We actually need to do more uh, synergy between our uh, uh, ed, uh, ancient research methods and tools and pick up from there and how it can uh, be brought into the present context. Because you know what will happen? The, act, the essence of Tantra Yukti, the essence of anything, if you dig, uh, dig into the uh, ancient research methods, was truth, finding truth. It was not about putting forth a certain agenda. So if you treat something with, uh, uh, you know, with reverence, you will naturally not tamper with it and make it dushita. So that is where Tantra Yukti will make it intellectually honest and ethical. So that's what's going to happen. And the whole thing is we have there's lots of aspects to look at. I'm only looking at uh, uh, methodolo uh, methodological tools, but there's also epistemology that needs to be still explored to see how it can be brought into data analysis, qualitative data analysis. So, but I'm not done yet. Sorry. I want to leave you with these instances. When I told you about uh, leading questions, uh, value-laden data, all the uh, arm twisting that was done on the field. This is one example. Please read it. I hope it's legible. Uh, everyone can see it. Read it out. Okay. So, all right. So, the field researcher in this case was a Western person who didn't know uh, the local language, which was Assamese. So, uh, he asked, have you and other women, I, I, I happen to be there, so I'm aware of what happened. He said, have you and other women participated in the protest against the government of, uh, uh, in, in, in Assam? Sorry, you're going too fast. Can you just... Okay, the first part is, have you and other women participated in this protest against the government in Assam? Uh, just to give you a, a timestamp, this was about uh, five years back. 
So uh, you can you can understand what are the political events happening there. Respondent said, no, I have not joined. So she's, uh, the field researcher asked, would you have joined if your religious head had asked for it? Respondent is saying, no, I would not have joined. Have you now, look at the counterfactual question. Have you ever felt threatened by members of the majority community in your area? Never. Look at the persistence of both, right? Finally, the field researcher says, okay, how do you think you may feel threatened by them in the future? Final hypothetical uh, statement. This makes sense if you're asking opinion. Do you like this wallpaper? Do you like this app? What if we had done this? What? But you can't deal with uh, social norms in, in, in this fashion, social phenomena. Now, this is another one, uh, again in Assam, where the researcher asked, is she all right? Referring to the respondent. Because from body language, it was obvious that she was probably in a hurry. Is she all right with continuing the session for a little longer? So there, now we have field interpreters who bring in their own interpretive into an already interpretive science. Please understand several levels of interpretation happening. So interpreter says, can you stay back for some more time? We have more things to discuss and interview. So the respondent, she uh, lives, uh, she's from Assam and she lived across the river. Now you have to take the ferry across to and fro to sell your uh, produce and you have to go back to your village. So she said, no, I have to go back. My boat leaves shortly and I have to hurry. I must hurry. Researchers understood from the body language, oh, she, so she has to leave. Interpreter says, yes, her husband does not want her to be delayed. Can you guess what uh, this, research, uh, this interpreter uh, was going to do in the foreign universities? Gender identity and multiculturalism. All right, I'm done. Thank you. So what happened to that uh, research study? So it was presented as a case It was published. There was a research report that happened that was well received. <laughs> you can imagine why it was well so received. So it reinforced all the stereotypes. Yes, it reinforced the stereotypes. It uh, found uh, its acceptance in the well-reputed journals. Uh, you know, obviously the Western peer-reviewed journals, it found its space there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I think uh, very wonderful presentation. The topic uh, very close related to design thinking also because it starts from the user-centric research and with empathy in the core. So now the question here, what I wanted to understand, which is still trying to just figure out, how is Tantra Yukti completely different from that? Like in the sense that what exactly are the ways, like you showed the, the biases, etc., which I understand. But how will Tantra Yukti originate? Like how so, does it work? Okay. That, Tan Tantra yeah. Yukti, sorry, you have more question to ask? No, I think it's just related that so that, you know, we can eliminate this bias and have a kind of more proper okay. uh, primary so, as well as ethnographic sure. research. So, Tantra Yukti essentially was located in the, uh, in the intellectual climate of Vidyasthanas and Brahma Sutras. So, it was actually the precursor can be seen in the Upanishads where, uh, you know, the student asks the uh, guru, you know, what, what is the reason for this phenomenon? Where the guru says, come after a few days, find out, come after a few days. Then we can have a dialogue on this and understand, right? And the idea was not to come up with something that is quick. The idea was you have understood, assimilated what you have understood, right? You have a dialogue. Where is the dialogue in the present day? There is no dialogue, it's just eco chambers there where people uh, uh, are talking, like I mentioned just now, the Western theoretical constructs, getting their papers published, sending it to uh, similar uh, academic fields. So there is no uh, search for truth. There is only search for uh, re uh, restoring the predetermined theoretical constructs of polarization. Is there, is there, like I mentioned, the Purva Paksha? Where is the Purva Paksha happening? How are they interpreting? Are we involved? We should be involved in that dialogue. Where is the, where is the, the, the whole dialogical process happening? We should be involved in Tantra Yukti was not about sitting in uh, uh, silos. If you look at the, uh, either, uh, like I said, there is no separate text for it. So you have to look at it in the texts of uh, Arthashastra, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call, the Charka Samhita, Sushruta Samhita and so forth. And so, yeah, it's there. They mention it. I have used this. I have used this, especially Kautilya, where he says this and therefore this, this and therefore this. Yeah. So we need to look at it in terms, I have mentioned it here in terms of research design, right? So it's not about the thesis construction and output. It's about research design so that we can take it forward to qualitative data analysis as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm, that was a very nice presentation. 
So uh, when I came across Tantrayukti, maybe two or three years back, I was actually blown away. Like we have something like this and even we have not heard about the name. But and uh, I did a course on this, but you know, to play the devil's advocate. The thing is that after the cohort did the course, we are like uh, blown up with the concepts and theories of all the tools and all. But uh, we are not able to take it to the practical world. So what I realized is that, and this is not exact, like this is in particular with Tantra Yikti, but also to different Indic courses also. Yes, yes. You That's know, why I mentioned Pramanas, yeah. Anumana and yeah. Agama. So yeah. uh, what is happening is that we are not able to develop a culture of Tantra Yukti. Like, you know, we have a culture of, you know, quantitative methods, qualitative methods, deductive, inductive method. So uh, those things were easily replicable in the academia. Whereas this culture of Tantra Yukti is lacking, which is the courses that are taught, it just becomes a, like, you no know, theories are loaded and after the cohort is over, everybody forgets. So what can happen, I'm, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to guess what your question was, uh, although it was just a comment. The uh, idea can be where you gather, you first frame the research question following a whole series of dialogue. Read the tantra, read the texts of where Tantra Yukti is manifest. First, that should be a course, right? Now figure out what is the research question you want to look at. How, how is that a research question and not something which is a tautology? Because that's what is happening in, often in many cases. It should not be a tautology, that's easy to prove. So it should be from teaching the course to actually going to the field after formulating the proper research design. Then they can, you know what, we can do a control group. Certain people who are exposed to the Tantra Yukti research methods and how they gathered data, how they made sense of it and how they presented it versus people who are completely in the Western paradigm. That's also a possibility. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Sure. I think Srinivas Jamalakadaka Garu has written a paper on Deepavali following the Adhikarana method. Hmm. That was, a, uh, I mean, it's a very simple topic that he has dealt in a very simple fashion. Wow. But I think just going through that, this is actually in response oh. to Abhishek Stanti. Okay. But to, sh to show how we can bring in this research methodology that is Indic and perhaps a conference like this. Uh, uh, with the guidance of sir would help us actually work on how the paper can be structured in a purely Indic way and not our t typical um, I, Western. Actually, I would not say throw away everything that's present because right. we can't, it's not workable, it's not practical. You need to make little inroads. Yes. As an academic, you need yes, to make, I'm, I'm saying that you need to do little inroads and get there. Yes, so try a little bit of synergy, right. then slowly try to see what is not making sense in the present day then throw that out. I'm talking about the present methods. Throw that, you know, right. bring in the... But then this is extremely the, useful. Thank you so sure. much. This also, also feels like, a, you know, precursor of what Linda Duhiwai Smith talk, spoke about while uh, writing about decolonizing and research methodologies. And perhaps we need sure. a, a book, similar book with, from you. So, thank you. <laughs> long way to go, hopefully. Thank, thank you. I think, yeah. On, Madhu. Yeah. I'll keep my question very short because there are more questions. Um, is this just uh, dealing with research methodology or also does it touch upon creation of metadata, creating categories and so on because that is the sort of the... Yes. And we face it a lot when we work yeah. with, especially with arts and crafts communities yes. because I mean I have worked with music communities that are called economically backward uh, minority yes, communities, whereas those, those. I would I would rate them as Raga Sangeeta philosophers yes. Yes. of rural India. Correct. So, but once the name is given, whatever I mean, the process we know it's clearly flawed. But do you also have a framework that can then? Yeah, we should. I, I'm looking at it in terms of data uh, research design, like I mentioned earlier, where you formulate your thesis, you formulate your, uh, sorry, you formulate your hypothesis, what is the likely research questions, and then when the data comes in, how are you going to get the data, first of all, like I said, there's a lot of uh, unethicality happening, and then how do you uh, analyze the data? We follow the grounded theory approach, uh, where we do affinitizing and stuff, which is again very, very bias-ridden. So I want ideally this to permeate all those categories, be it labels, stereotype, stereotypical labels given to so-called backward, so-called uh, you know underprivileged or uneducated and stuff like that, and work forward with that. Right? We need to work with more. There's more tantra yukti tools that need to be similar to that, even in Nyaya Shastras. Explore. Yes. 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 That's also possible. Yes. 
you can Yes, like I said, I mentioned just now to Abhishek, you can create a control group and then work with that. Sorry, I think Tarini has been wanting to ask. Okay. Uh, first of all, blown away by the presentation. Absolutely blown away. It gave me... You were bang on on so many things. And uh, there are some things that I want to also... Uh, I think I have an insight on what the things were. Hmm. So, so first thing... Um, like you said, the yes, no questions that were asked, okay, the community work that ma'am said. Yes. That, first of all, uh, as a person who writes stories, I know when you, as an engineer, when you want to reverse engineer a rasa, you can create a conversation to create a rasa, okay. So, the thing is, when you want a certain answer, you can ask a certain question. Yes. That's called Bayesian reasoning. Right. Doctors do that, okay. Right. Right. So, you using conditional probability based on basically every conversation comes with a certain, every uh, vaad, vivad comes with a certain context, you're using that context against the person in the next question. Correct. Correct. We do that all the time, okay. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. we use ba the Bayesian reasoning and those people who ask the questions, they know exactly the answers they need. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, they reverse engineer the questions Correct. from their own perspective, perspective and right. their own tautologies like you right. said. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, that is one thing, you know, zeroing in on, in on while working with the communities, how to get the answers with context uh, without the Bayesian reasoning, Bayesian reasoning questions. Okay. That would be uh, one way to work in uh, yes. from the ground up. Definitely. Then, um, uh, then you said Apavarga and Vikalpa. In, uh, and also um, Samshaya while collecting the data. Hmm. Hmm. Samshaya while collecting the data and Apavarga Visarga, uh, Visarga Vikalpa. Vikalpa during formation of the uh, uh, hypothesis or no, what was the I, analysis? Yeah. yeah. So I think there the problem is the person who is forming or uh, you know forming the right. analysis sometimes doesn't know what data point is absent. The Correct. concept of perception of the absence of a data point is not there and that right. perception only gets and I'll connect it back to the first topic in the uh, in the day, coaching intelligence. Right. How to perceive something that is missing. So, um, mm. what I would recommend, I'm looking at the second question, is interdisciplinarity. If you look at Tantra Yukti, Tantra Yukti is across disciplines. I mean, I didn't have the time to go through it, but let's look at statecraft. I mentioned the text, so I'm guessing you'd have understood, right, from Ayurveda to Arthashastra. Mm. They were all different, statecraft, medicine, uh, various aspects, but they are all interrelated. Here today, what's happening is only certain researchers are looking at it. Bring in people from other fields. Exactly. Brainstorm yeah. during, during the grounded theory. Uh, data analysis which we, which we do with affinity at that point bring in people the profs from different uh, disciplines make it uh, interdisciplinary in that way yeah it yeah. becomes interdisciplinary it becomes multidisciplinary you want convergence mm -hmm. you want triangulation it's going to happen right there exactly in exactly and the questions that even might have un like you know there is a cohort that is not mm. comfortable answering certain questions might come from the outside those right. questions right absolutely yeah. open the dialogue open the dialogue that is the way exactly. i see it yeah. did i answer your question uh, sushruti ji the, yeah okay tar okay. tarani ji and uh, sarita ji i have been waiting uh, to give the whole context of this talk uh, so that we can move on to the next paper. Uh, this uh, abstract was sent by her and uh, I immediately got excited and allowed it just by looking at the topic without even <laughs> going through the abstract. And uh, when I accepted and said that it was good, then I was told that uh, Sarita ji is the younger sister of Sahana ji. I am, I'm sorry, I'm... <laughs> no, no, you are the elder, okay. No, I'm not no. elder. That's what I said. Oh. Yeah, she's the younger sister. So they are sisters, they are siblings. So that's one point. So we wanted Sri Prada's father to come. Now Sahanaji is already on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> she, her sister. Yeah, you have oh, to I touch her feet. feet. Okay. And uh, another important point that uh, is needed is how is this a pedagogy? Uh, basically. Uh, if you go to a Sanskrit department of a general university or a Sanskrit university or a Sanskrit Vidya Peter, the first thing that happens to any Sanskrit scholar who enters, earlier it was MPhil also was there, is the biggest intimidation that comes from research methodology. You know, the, the most frightening thing, horror of all the things 
and all these traditional scholars get they sh shudder at the very word research methodology and say what is this i have to learn and by uh, they are given a textbook of research methodology that is available in the market and all the available research methodology books are meant for social sciences sometimes most of the times then they include a huge amount of quantitative research so these researchers who are working in nyaya vyakarana vedanta and most of the time sahitya some something in kalidasa they come and ask other people how do i develop a questionnaire what is the zero hypothesis what is the sampling size what is the reliability and validity in all this poor sanskrit scholar gets shuddered and ultimately he jumps into manuscript research or something which is very easy for him critical edition development and all that and gets afraid of this research methodology so this fellow called research methodology who is frightening unnecessarily all our sanskrit scholars who are already very well grounded in research methodology from their nyaya from their tarka and all that this fellow has to be driven out of the university campuses that is the first project so we were actually conducting a workshop called vedic research methodology and uh, dr jayaraman mahadevan who earlier was with krishnamacharya institute he is a product of uh, vedavignan gurukul bangalore he worked at krishnamacharya institute now he moved back to his uh, parent organization sv asa he was giving one of the classes on tantra yukti actually let me clarify to all of you tantra yukti as a word is not proper the original word is plural tantra yuktis this is uh, the word and this whole thing comes from ayurveda this is an ayurvedic book originally it was composed and written for ayurveda and amazingly that book contains a section of how to draft a dissertation after your research typically such a coincidence that all your research methodology textbooks today they include the last part of it how to write the dissertation how to write the report writing the style manual and all that this includes this tantra yuktis the work tantra yuktis includes that style manual part research drafting part and all that and the phd of uh, jayaraman mahadevan was focusing on that basically and he was also speaking on that part drafting side of the dissertation but the tantra yuktis as such is such a humongously huge part that what is covered today in this is not the whole so if we are discussing here thinking that all that is said today is the whole of tantra yukti so i got tantra yukti from this talk uh, actually it is not even a speck of a dust of the whole work of tantra yukti uh, which has come from ayurveda so now the uh, point is that tantra yukti were taught to ayurveda uh, scholars so research methodology was part of the pedagogy of ayurveda and now if you look at tantra yuktis the way they have been composed inside they are applicable across the board not just to ayurveda and ayurveda is a hard science so it can be applied to the other hard sciences also and the amazing thing that sarita ji was doing here today was she has taken it to her social anthropological uh, work which jayaraman mahadevan ji was not doing it's not a blame on him he is not from social anthropology so obviously he cannot do that so he she has brought it to social anthropology that's one example if uh, any one of you can do it for all other of your disciplines and show how this can be taken to the other disciplines from ayurveda tantra yuktis can be taken that is the project is served the mission is served uh, from uh, this conference so the word has to spread now all over that 
we have a humongous amount of research methodology material that was taught as part of pedagogy at least for a particular branch of sciences ayurveda and that can be taken to universities and because it is all in sanskrit if these tantra yuktis work is put in the hands of sanskrit scholars of sanskrit departments of university sanskrit uh, university sanskrit vidya peethas and all that all their horror will be gone they will be very happy they will enjoy that there is a research methodology that is coming from their own background that is the biggest solution that we can offer to our unjustifiably intimidated terrified and horrified traditional sanskrit scholars